Thank you, Pastor Peter. Um, I want to speak today about a revived heart. What does a revived heart look like? And the reason I um, I came to this is because obviously um, there's great interest in the move of God that's taking place in Asbury University and the young students, as we heard, um, seeking the Lord. And, um, you know, uh, whether, I, I mean, whether you call it revival or not is a big thing. Uh, in America, remember, revival is is commonly used for many, many things. So um, in, in American Christian culture, because of a lot of the revivals that they that they have had, um, uh, they have revival meetings, they have revival this, revival that. So it's a very loose term in America. That's not. Uh, uh, but in, in Britain, historically, um, revival hasn't been such a loose term. Um, uh, there's more boxes to tick historically before um, the, the historical evangelical church would call something a revival. Hey, it, it doesn't matter, but I just want to make make um, make that plain because sometimes um, uh, when, when people call something a revival, everybody starts arguing over what a revival is, what it isn't, and you know, and it's just people have different definitions. But it certainly is a powerful move of God powerful move of God amongst those students and one of the things that um uh I, I felt that you know not, not that I'm an expert on it but the reports and seeing some of the clips and hearing uh, one of the things that hit me was um the simplicity um and the honesty and the transparency of um these you were hearing of these students in bringing things to the lord that the worship again is the simplicity from the heart the transparency and the honesty that 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 is taking place um when someone says revival and uh, it gets broadcast uh, especially in america um it can take on a life of its own because what what can happen is when when when, when there's a move of god and it's called revival is uh, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly surface. Um, and that always happens with revival. Whenever God sends his Holy Spirit in power, uh, you'll find three things. You'll find a great move of the Holy Spirit in people's hearts, um, perhaps miracles, but a real move of God in changing people, saving people. And we're, we're seeing that. But alongside that, you'll also see a rise in the flesh, um, when the Holy Spirit comes in power, um, he also, um, uh, as well as changing people's hearts, he also puts his finger on the flesh in people's lives. That's why you get the Pharisees so reacting against Jesus's revival. Um, and so when that happens, there has to be a lot of repentance or else you get hardened against what's going on and you want to control what's getting on like what's happening like the pharisees and then of course the third thing that you have is a rise in demonic manifestation uh that that the holy spirit wants to deliver people from and dethrone the enemy so when the holy spirit comes in power incredible things take place in people's lives uh, you know the signs of revival flesh comes to the surface either to be dealt with or to oppose uh the work of the spirit and the demonic things that are hidden demonic things that have maybe gone underground the holy spirit provokes these things so that he can uh deal powerful blows to the to the enemy and um you know uh, it doesn't all happen equally but you have to be aware of these these three things because sometimes people have criticized past moves of God as being of the devil because um, the devil showed up. Well, of course he would. Uh, this is a battle. Um, others have criticized other moves of God because they saw something fleshly or somebody was fleshly in the way that they did things. Well, yes, the flesh will come up to be dealt with. Um, uh, but also, of course, the good things of, uh, well, they all can all be good things if we respond well, but the, the saving, the sanctifying, the changed lives, the soul saved, all, all these wonderful, wonderful things um, that, that take place. And so, um, you know, uh, it, it, what's lovely about this um, move of God is that, is that uh, when I talk about the flesh arising, um, I was reading that they'd had many contacts in this university from 
um, prominent and famous worship leaders and uh, prominent uh, preachers in America. I don't know who um, they're too gracious to say, which is nice, uh, asking, you know, that they were very willing to help out with what was going on there in Asbury. You know, of course they what they are. They, 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 they want to get a piece of the action, don't they? And the wonderful thing was, I just thought, which, which is part of what I'm talking about tonight, is that they were very kind and said, um, you, you know, you're very welcome to come along. And if there's a, a seat you can find um, to sit and worship the Lord with us, but, um, you know, we're going to continue as we are. Uh, as the Holy Spirit is leading us using the people that God has led, uh, ordinary people, if I can put that, who are becoming extraordinary. And I like that. And it made me think, this is where I'm coming to, it made me think, you know, I love that passage in Acts chapter 2, verse 40 to 47, because in Acts chapter 2, we see the model of what I consider to be full revival. And I'm not saying you have to have everything uh, that Acts two has to call it a revival i'm not i I mean i wrote a book on revivals um land of hope and glory revivals throughout um british history and each chapter is a a a different revival um um so uh, i just want we just want god to move don't we whatever whatever people call it we just want god to move so i'm not saying you have to have everything in acts 240 but it'd be nice to have some of it wouldn't it and i don't know much more than that about the Asprey uh, move of the Holy Spirit. Don't know much more about that. Um, um, but um, when, when we when we go to Acts chapter two verse forty, we do have a wonderful Acts chapter two, a wonderful picture of revival. It's um, it comes out of Pentecost, as you know, a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, the preaching of the gospel comes with power, cuts people to the heart. Uh, many, many people are getting radically saved. And uh, the message is uh, be saved from this perverse generation. That's the message of, of the revival is 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 this 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 generation is perverse and you need to get out of it. It's the exact opposite to what some people in the Church of England are saying, where they are saying become as close as you can to um the generation that you're in um and 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 that's the way that they're heading on the contrary christianity is countercultural um people want to get out of what they're in they don't want it mirrored in a church what's the point of going to a church that just believes all the perverse stuff not all the perverse but i'm not talking about the church of england now specifically but what's the point in going to a church that just believes in in the morality that's out there or is very close to it there's no difference there's no radical com why would you radically convert to a church that um just accepts everything that the, that the cult the that the um ungodly culture you're in uh accepts so here we see this and anyway i i've got to be careful because i'll i'll go through each verse because it's i love meditating on it but let me just read it for you Acts chapter 2 verse 40 and think this is a picture a model of, of what of what we aspire to when we pray for revival and with many other words peter testified and exhorted them see that's all part of it saying be saved from this perverse the word is actually crooked generation then those who gladly gladly received his word were baptized and that day about three thousand souls were added to them if that's just the counting of the men it means that it was bigger because of their families and they continued steadfastly in the apostles teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as any had need. So you have this great um, outpouring of generosity. Um, and then so continuing daily, this was ongoing with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. Where they ate their food. And here's what I've highlighted with gladness and simplicity of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and 
the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And we could spend ages on looking at this and the message of Peter beforehand and and saying this is a high watermark of revival. And um, and this is what this is the best we can believe God pray for and um, and hope for. But sometimes you'll get different aspects of this. God, God, God does what God wants to do. And uh, and the reason I, 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 I highlighted gladness and simplicity of heart is that what, that is my sort of like, uh, the little I know about Asprey, the little I know, and um, that's what struck me, the gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, you know, uh, and, and the fear, the respect that's there at the altar as people do business um, with God, but gladness and simplicity of heart. So in, in this model revival, if I might say, you have gladness, you have fear, and you have simplicity of heart. And so this is something that we don't have to wait for revival for, um, you know, uh, let's not wait for revival. <laughs> It'll never come. Let, let, let's let's um, respond to what what the Holy Spirit has already given us, and He's given us so much to respond to, and that, and then we see where that takes us. But um, the first word is they ate their food with gladness, and, th and that gladness in in the New Testament is a wonderful thing. Gladness of heart, gladness and simplicity of heart, and that gladness is joy, it's appreciation, it's delight, it's thankfulness. Uh, I remember, I can't remember who it was, but somebody once said, and I thought that's so true, that um, what God hates most of all is ungratefulness. Out of everything, ungratefulness. I guess one could say that maybe pride he hates as well, more than anything, but, you know, as well. but ungratefulness can lead to pride. So it's all, it's all interrelated. When we think about Romans chapter one, where people knowing what was evident through creation, um, didn't acknowledge or thank God. So if there's one thing that, well, maybe two, but you know, one of the things that God hates the most is ingratitude, in ingratitude. Don't know if you've ever been in a place where, um, where you've been astonished by someone's ingratitude. Uh, I remember once there was a, a young lad, a little lad, and I don't blame him. He's just a little kid. But um, I just thought, you know, it's his birthday coming. I'm going to get him something. And I knew he liked cars. And so um, I got him a, a set of cars, quite nice cars, actually. And then um, I gave it to him with his dad. It was there on um, on his birthday Sunday. And um, he he opened the them up and um, he said, uh, he said, and it wasn't the cars that he liked. It's this car show. I forgot what it's called on on the children's thing. Um, poor, poor, poor patrol. And he goes, he opened it. It wasn't poor patrol. He went, I like poor patrol. I thought, how, in, how you know, he's only a little lad. He's only about four. But I thought that's a bit ingratitude. That's a that's not very grateful. And his dad was really embarrassed and everything. Um, but you know. You know, you know, there's so much for us to be grateful for. And it says that when he preached and said, be saved from this perverse generation, they gladly received his word. I mean, thinking about that, you know, I think there's a lot of people there that would really like the good news. And I think there's a lot of people that are getting to place with this perverse generation that we live in in Great Britain and especially in London, that there's a lot of people that would gladly, gladly receive the word of be rescued from this perverse um generation uh i don't want to be negative about politicians all the time but have you, have you seen that young young lady that wants to be in charge of the snp and she's a she's a christian and uh, just out there honesty amazing isn't it funny how you can go from one extreme woman with ex with, with the the most extreme views nicholas sturgeon on um on gender to a Christian, <laughs> not that she'll get it or, or whatever. But anyway, I just thought, it, 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 you know, there she is standing up um, and not, not railing against anybody else's view, but standing up against a crooked view of gender. 
Um, and then, and then, uh, and so they, so they did these things. Now, this gladness is gratefulness. And I think that in um, Ashbury, again, I'm no expert. I've only just seen clips, but there was a gratefulness and a joy in their worship. I don't know if you noticed. And it wasn't ramped up worship. And sometimes, and I've got no problem with, like, come on, everybody, let's go for it. I've got no problem with that. I'm not problem with that. We need to exhort, you know, the Bible says, shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph, lift your voice, clap your hands, all you know. So, you know, we exhort each other. But when the Holy Spirit moves, less exhor exhortation is necessary. Um, uh, and, and, um, and, and I just saw clips of it. And, you know, I just looked at them worshipping and they were singing the old hymns as well as the new. And what I thought was, they're just really grateful. They're really thankful for what's happening. They're grateful to God. It, their worship is, you know, joyful, grateful, uh, and it comes from a grateful heart. And 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 so here they had gladness of heart. This describes the people in Acts two forty. It says the people. Well, we've had all this stuff happening. We've got bread and prayers. We've got meetings and giving and everything like that. But when it comes to their heart, it's glad. It's glad, and you know. Uh, Hebrews 1 9 God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness above all your companions and so God wants us to be joyful even in difficult times and so being joyful is is to remember the things to be thankful for it really is true count your blessings one by one see what the Lord has done and um uh you know, sometimes we, include myself, can focus too much on the depressing things and the things that haven't happened and everything like that. But when you sit back and just thank God for the little things, thank you for food today. Thank you that it was sunny or thank you for clothes or thank you, just little things. And then thank you for saving me. Thank you that I'm going to heaven. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you, as Pastor Peter was saying, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your character. Thank you. Thank you. It does lift you. And so gladness of heart. The, ne the next one is simplicity of heart. Simplicity of heart. And this word is a little bit um, worth digging into because the um, gladness of heart is, you know, what it means. But here, um, the sim sim the it, um, sometimes you get um, singular heart or, or, or simplicity of heart. Well, here's the Greek word that's called aphelotes, aphelotes, that, that is used. Now, this word, it doesn't simply mean simplicity. It actually means without rock, smooth, plain. And so it's talking about a smoothness with no jagged edges, you see, aphelotes, thelos means rocky land where you could stub your, you know, stub your foot on a stone. Thelos. And what, what the Greeks often do to reverse a word is they stick an A in front, you know, like Christ, antichrist, where you put, you know, an antichrist. So thelos, stick an A in front of thelos, basically, and it's the reverse. So thelos means very rocky not smooth at all, very jagged, jagged. You can stub your foot in this type of thing. But aphelotus is the absolute opposite. It's smooth, it's plain, and therefore, figuratively, um, people have translated it as um, simplicity. And so this, this simplicity, or some put it, some translations say, gladness and simplicity of heart. Some translations say gladness and singleness of heart. Some translations say uh, gladness and sincerity of heart. Some translations say gladness and humility of heart. And I think all, all of those are, um, are, are good ways of trying to describe the hearts, the simple, the humble, the sincere, the single singleness um, of, of heart. There's no stumbling. There's a smoothness about their character. There's a plainness about their speaking. There's there's a simplicity about their faith. Um, like Nathaniel, uh, in which there 
it, Jesus said, Nathaniel, in whom there is no guile. And I often think about the simplicity of heart, the singleness of heart, the smoothness of heart with no rocky bits, jagged bits, um, but smoothness of heart. Um, I often I often think of um, the example of children, children. You know how great children are as the example. Uh, if you want to be if you want to rep- if you want the kingdom of God, you have to become like a child. And I've been thinking about children recently because. When I went on holiday last week uh, with my wife and uh, we were going to different parks and she's a teacher at a girls school. And um, and, and and when we were at one of these parks or one of these places we were visiting, um, I noticed little children skipping. And I said to Nicola, and I spoke, spoke to her before, I said, isn't it wonderful how little children skip? They, do, they don't even think about it. They don't even notice it. They can't just walk and they don't go into a run. They just can't help but skip. It's the, and I really, really, over the last couple of years since I noticed this, in, it makes my heart glad. If I'm in a park or I'm walking past a family and there's the little girl or the little boy or whatever, and they're behind and they're, they're just skipping because that skipping tells you everything about what's going in there, on in their heart, doesn't it? Happy enough to skip. And Nicola, I'd spoken to her before about skipping children that I just think it's wonderful. It just says so much about what's going on the inside of them. And she said, yeah, she said, I can't remember if it was age seven or eight, I can't remember. But she said, I've noticed that at about age seven, um, they sort of stopped skipping. And so she she would say to some of the girls, so I think were about the age seven or eight, I can't remember which one it was, um, when the little toddlers in the school um, would come from their nursery section or whatever, the young, the young infants, to come to assembly, and they would come first, and the older girls, seven, eight, nine, I don't know, uh, they would be waiting for them. Nick would always say, look at them all, look at them skipping. Do you remember when you used to skip? When did you stop skipping? And they go, we don't know. I said, isn't it strange how we stop skipping? And they go, and they were like, oh, yeah, that's weird. And I said to Nick, I said, um, I said, you don't teach a child to skip. They might look, they might catch it or be infectious. You know, skipping might be infectious. You don't teach a child to skip, but it's a wonderful thing to see. And I love it. I just love to see children just break out into a little skip because that shows me what's going on in their heart right now. And I just use that as an illustration because I've been thinking about it a lot. And, and I love seeing children just spontaneously, little children spontaneously skipping because I th- I wish to myself, I wish I felt like they did to spontaneously skip. Can you imagine when did you last skip? <laughs> when did you last skip? Probably when you were three, four, five, six. But, you know, to, imagine you walking down the street and you don't even realise that you just start skipping. You see, and I just thought, and then I thought to myself, you know, the, 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 this childlike faith, it's 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 not um an unreasonable faith. Um, it's not a faith that you know can't do deep theology if it wants to, but there's something in it about the relationship between God, and um, uh, and I think that sometimes we can get too complex um, with everything around us, and there's and in the end this keeping hearts simple before God, simple hearts before before God. Um, in one of my chapters in my book on Land of Hope and Glory, I, I, I talk about the early um, Quakers and um, Fox, who was their leader, Fox. And Fox in those early days during the Civil War, he would go around and, he, and he'd say, I was trying to, I'd always try and find tender people. He called them tender people tender people and what he meant was meeting a christian that had a tender heart a a real simple simple just loves the lord just loves the lord you know what i'm saying Uh, and just has that tender heart and out of tender heart um what george fox did is he turned it into friends friends and isn't it wonderful when you're when you've got a tender heart before the lord and you're fellowshipping on a sunday or you're in your life group and you hear somebody else talking and you just say, wow, I'm so blessed by them talking about that and how much they love the Lord. They've got tender hearts or, or they or they or we're friends because we've got so much in common. We just love the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. The family of God, when it's got smoothness, simplicity of heart, openness, no, no guile, no, no trying to manipulate. No, no, you know, just just this simple 
simple thing, not trying to take advantage of what's going on um, in the revival or trying to own the revival. I don't know. Um, I remember in the 90s, there was a lot of talk about moves of God and there was well it was moves of God and stuff and coming to London and everything like that and a lot of people were blessed by it but I wasn't blessed by what was obvious in certain quarters of certain leaders that decided they were the one that were going to lead it and then um, I know of certain groups of leaders who fell out with one another over revival because um, they wanted to use revival to push their emphasis one wanted revival to push uh, uh to push uh, um roman catholicism and bring them in um uh, but others said well we can't do that and then another one wanted to push their weird theology on the openness of god that god doesn't even know what's happening tomorrow and another one wanted to push something else and it was like well what are these things got to do with seeking god so people were sort of like were, were taking what was happening and wanting to ride off it and utilize it in order to, to push their agendas or their books or their theologies, or even perhaps themselves, you know? Well, that's 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 not what we're we're seeing in in this um this aspiry. We're seeing students, aren't we? Not professors, although the professors are very encouraging. It's wonderful to he hear what they do. But we, we just see normal people. We're seeing the people that we see in Acts. Of course, there's leadership there. But there. Of course, they're just not le left to their own devices. Of course, there are leaders among the students and everything like that. But there's a simplicity. And um, that they're not trying to be anything. They're not all going on circuit preaching across across america they're all still doing their studies so there's something simple and beautiful about about this and um and, and i just think what we can learn and what we can focus on is let's be glad you know and grateful and and let's keep no matter how deep we want to go in our reading and our study and our thinking and all these things in the end let's keep our hearts smooth not jagged and simple before the Lord. And no matter how technical we get with our theology and everything like that, and how complex life is, let's make sure that when it, when it comes to standing before the Father, we are we are um we're like children that skip. I wonder, it's not I wonder that when we get to heaven, whether we'll get our skip skipping back. I wonder when we get to heaven and all the cares of this world have gone and all the sorrows and all the things we've gone through, that when we get to heaven, we'll get our skip back. And we will just like a little child, just be in awe of everything and everything, a new discovery, everything wonderful, everything happy. And I wonder, you know, that, that but uh, we might get our skip back in heaven. But we should also make sure that there's as, as much as we can with the Holy Spirit, there's still a skip in our hearts because we are grateful. Thank you, Pastor Peter. Mm -hmm.